are experiencing and we've never really been here before. A lot of stress And that's happening. everyone. Yeah, yeah, so this will help in that area. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Um, a lot of people are still logging in. Yes. And we're doing our best to try to let people in, but we've got people from Niagara and Coburg mm -hmm. and Aurelia, Bracebridge. We're so um, glad that you're here. Bradford, wow. Pastor Ida, yes. Wow. Um, a lot of people have been gardening and reading. Wow. Somebody has been purging stuff from their phone. Yep. Fantastic. Someone actually said barbering. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people have become barbers. Yes. During this time. Yes. yes. Self barbering, giving yourself a new hairdo. Yep. That's all right. Yeah. We have time to grow it back out. It'll be fine. <laughs> uh, oh, and from Ottawa, too. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. So we're still letting some people in. All right. Do that. Um, and while Orlando's doing that, I'm actually going to tell you something about our speaker this evening. Mm -hmm. um, a really good friend of ours, Dr. David Defoe, yes. is a licensed clinical professional counselor, a national certified counselor, a certified grief recovery specialist, and a family life educator. Yes. He is also the Relationship Ministries Director at Allega Allegheny, Allegheny East. East Conference. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Seriously? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Allegheny East Conference. Mm -hmm. But he also happens to be one of our classmates when we were in seminary yes. together. And yes. he is a really good friend of ours. Um, he has presented in Ontario in the past. And we're so thankful that he's here. Yep. He mm. is husband to Denise and father to Dana. There we go. Yes. Yeah. And so, Dr. David, do you want to say hi? Where are you at? There you go. Well, hello, everybody. I want to uh, thank uh, Liz and Orlando for uh, inviting me. Uh, Liz used to take my notes. Uh, it, she used to, I used to uh, use her notes in seminary. So literally, I wouldn't uh, be a pastor if it wasn't for uh, uh, Liz. Um, but I want to thank uh, both of them for having me on. And listen, for Ontario Conference, I want to let you all know you all have absolutely the best family life leaders uh, in the in the world. I mean, I copy all of their stuff. So um, I just want to uh, thank them for this invitation and for uh, the good work that they do. Awesome. Thanks for being here, my friends. Um, we're going to pray over you and then we're going to give you the time. OK, sure. Let's, let's pray, friends. God, thank you once again for another opportunity to worship you freely and to learn. We count it as a privilege to have Dr. David Defoe with us here yes. today. And so bless our time together. Mm -hmm. Be with those who are hearing and those who are seeing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, listen, what, what we'll do is uh, we'll utilize sort of the chat box. And then um, for questions and stuff, I guess we'll come back on and we'll talk about questions um, in a couple of minutes. But um, Liz and Orlando wanted me to share with you all some things um, about specifically anxiety and how we can maintain our emotional wellness. And as Orlando said uh, in the intro, we have not been here before. Hmm. Um, for many of us, this time of quarantining, this time of uh, physical distancing, this time of uh, uh, this time of staying at home. Um, I don't know uh, if you all are experiencing mm -hmm. the same challenges that we're experiencing here uh, in the U.S. Um, but you muted him. it definitely could be a time of great fear and apprehension. Um, pandemics are scary, and no matter how we try to spin it or change it or reframe it in our minds. We're living in a time of fear. And so mm -hmm. amid the COVID-19 pandemic, many people are trying to figure out ways to adjust to life in quarantine, as well as develop, um, as well as develop ways to cope with heightened levels of, say, depression and mm -hmm. anxiety. We see some things in families occurring where, you know, if you're like Liz in Orlando and you all get along and you love each other, or if you're like <laughs> me and my wife and uh, you all have fun together, you know, quarantining in the house is cool. It's, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. But imagine if you were with someone that you could Imagine if you were with someone that you could uh, someone that, uh, someone that got under your, your skin it would be harder to quarantine in those cases. And so I want to just talk to you all about how it is that we can maintain or, or continue to be emotionally healthy people uh, during this time. Hopefully you all can see uh, the graphic there on the screen. 
I'm just going to walk through a couple of things, but we're going to talk primarily about this idea of fear and anxiety. And we'll start sort of talking about what anxiety looks like or what anxiety feels like. Now, for all of us, there is healthy anxiety for every last one of us. So um, there is, there, there is a, a mental health condition related to anxiety, a generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, stuff like that. We don't got to talk about that. Um, but uh, for most of us, we do experience some anxiety. And it looks like it, it looks different for all of us, right? And so when we talk about anxiety, what we mean is anxiety is an emotional, is an emotional, is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension or worried thoughts and physical changes like increased be, uh, blood pressure. But it's more than just that. It, it, anxiety also involves feelings of nervousness or being on edge or feelings of worry or an inability to relax. Any of these sound like this is what you're going through right now? Mm -hmm. um, it, it can involve physical symptoms such as sweating or trembling or, um, or, or dizziness. But anxiety has at its root this, this word here that many of us are afraid of, mm -hmm. fear. Many of us develop anxiety or we develop anxious symptoms because we're afraid. And I know sometimes as Christians, you know, we have our faith and we have our trust in God. And um, it's antithetical to uh, faith to believe that we should be afraid of certain things. But the truth of the matter is there are some things that scare us. And if we're to be honest, uh, fear, is, fear, is gen fear and panic in particular um, have the problem have the potential to get very problematic if we're not careful about it or if we don't plan for it or if we're not honest about it right so i want to talk a little bit about fear uh as the root of anxiety and in this time of of covid19 many of us if we're to be honest we have a reason to be afraid we you know we've lost we've lost loved ones we have people that are working in in hospitals that are working um, in nursing homes that are working um, in essential jobs and they're going out of the house every day and we don't know when they come back home um, if they're bringing something back with them. And many of us are um, holding our breaths through those 14 days of, of self-quarantining when we are exposed to someone who may have COVID-19. And it is creating a lot of fear and a lot of panic in a lot of people. And so uh, I think it's important for us to sort of discuss how our fear responses work. And then we'll talk a little bit about where, um, where our ability to cope with life's exigencies sort of comes from. So fear is generally considered a reaction to something uh, immediate, immediate that threatens sort of your safety or your security, right? Um, such as if you're being startled by someone. Uh, or jumping out behind you. That the emotion of fear is felt as a sense of dread, uh, altering, uh, altering you to the possibility that your physical self might actually be uh, in harm, right? And so I know that many of you all may have heard this before, seen something like this before, but all of us have one of these three common fear reactions, right? So uh, maybe you've heard of these before. The notion of fight or flight is considered sort of a fear response and describes the behavior that various animals or mammals or humans go through um, to escape danger. Um, so it describes, it, it describes behavior in that if you, have, uh, if you have something that comes to you that makes you afraid, Many of us, we have the natural inclination that we're going to fight back. If you, someone jumps off and jumps out of the, uh, the, the woods at you, if you're someone like Orlando, you may lunge forward at them, right? You have a, you have, I'm just sorry, Orlando. Uh, you, you, have a, you, have a, you have a fight mechanism. When exigencies or, or problems come your way, you're ready to tackle them head on. Well, some of us, um, uh, if you are in danger, uh, some of us, we run away. That's more like me, okay? I'm gonna run. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a fighter unless you can catch me. And I can't run that fast, so you're probably gonna catch me. But, um, but uh, th that's me, I, I run away. So there's the fight tendency, and then there's also 
the flight tendency, right? And there are responses that we utilize to sort of deal with the problems that come our way, the challenges that we come our way. However, there's a new one that has been added to this fight or flight uh, uh, discussion, and it's been recognized in people and in animals to have another response. So a person or an animal may play dead or may freeze in response to being threatened. Um, uh, you, so you may yell or, or, or scream as a fighting response, or you may isolate as sort of a flight response, or you may just choose to just sit there and do nothing and act like any, uh, nothing exists. Whatever it is that we choose to do, whether it's freeze, whether we fly, whether we fight, or whether we uh, uh, run away, we all have to develop a plan to deal with the challenges that we're faced with on a daily basis. And COVID-19 um, has really made this heightened for all of us where it has affected uh, globally everyone. So a lot of times maybe we experience things in North America that those um, in, in, in other parts of the world aren't experiencing. But right now during this time, all of us are going through this same amount of difficulty, this same fear, this same problems with this, uh, with, with, this, with this pandemic or this virus or this illness. And so I think it's very important for us to pay attention to what we're predisposed to as far as our fear reactions are, because that oftentimes determines how it is we deal with anxiety. It, it even comes down to if we're to just spend a little bit talking about relationships, um, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're dating, um, it, 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 it comes down to our relationships as well. So if I have someone, if I have a problem with my spouse or my boyfriend or my girlfriend um, or friend and I'm confrontational, I may lean in and I may express my feelings uh, uh, verbally or I may uh, confront somebody. If if I de if I've dealt with abandonment things, or if I've dealt with um, problems in the past, and I've been hurt, a lot of times when I'm when I get into conflict, my natural inclination is to walk away or to not engage in the conflict. And then for some of us, and this is probably one of the most dangerous ones, for some of us, we're like, yeah, we're not running away. <laughs> we're not talking, we're not gonna confront you. We're just gonna act like it doesn't exist, that freeze pattern. And so, but we see that, we see that uh, range of responses all across the continuum across the world of people as they deal with this challenge, as they deal with um, the fear that is associated uh, with uh, COVID-19. And, and we'll come back to some of the things that we can do to deal with these. But let me just move on really quickly. Um, I don't even know what this is supposed to say. Oh, okay. This is supposed to say, uh, this is supposed to talk about the six ways in which we form or formulate our responses to problems or difficulties. These are the things that, um, that determine our, our ability to deal with the challenges that we face, and then also some of the challenges mental, mentally or mental health wise that we also face. And so I think I may have put that bottom half in white and the white didn't transfer. But hopefully you all can see these. The first thing that um, sort of determines how we respond and how we react to, to things around us is our chemistry. Th this is just simply what it says. It, it's our biology. These, there are some illnesses, there are some problems that are rooted in nothing but our DNA or our physical makeup. Uh, these are the things that we were born with. Some of us were born with uh, predispositions or, or certain propensities uh, toward certain behaviors. Um, some of us, uh, our, our, our chemical makeup or our biology has predisposed us to certain um, mental illnesses or some or certain emotional instabilities, right? Um, not only our chemistry, but it also uh, relates to our connections. Some of us, we, we develop difficulties in managing um, life's exigencies based off our connections or our relationships, you know, the people that we surround ourselves with. Uh, primary relationships and attachments are oftentimes formed with our parents and then by extension our siblings and then we learn how to respond, uh, how to love oftentimes from our parental relationships and the romantic attachments or the romantic relationships that we get into and the friendships that we form um, also impact us uh, immensely as well. Um, my mom used to always say, yeah, I can tell you who you are by who you hang out with. Well, this is what she meant. All right. Um, I shouldn't make fun of my mother. She may actually find this on Facebook and try to travel 300 miles to come get me. 
Anyway, um, this next one, circumstances, circumstances. Uh, these are the things that happen in and around us. They're oftentimes things that are beyond our control. So one thing we're seeing now is that uh, the circumstances, the circumstances of life um, are causing us deeper fear, deeper anxiety. There are many of us that nothing in the world has ever af made us afraid. We've been able to deal with every curveball that life has thrown us. We've had so much resiliency, but now we find ourselves in a difficult time because of life's circumstances. All right, here's another one. Can you all still see these? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. This next one, I think someone is drawing on my slides. This next one is, uh, is, is consciousness, right? Consciousness is how we take a look and how we interpret the things around us or our perceptions or how we take in those things that we've either have heard or have been told about ourselves. And so they have everything to do with how we interpret what we see. All right. And here's another one, right? Um, cognition. Cognition has everything to do with how we think. Now, how many of you all have heard something called negative thinking patterns or, or, negative, uh, or negative thoughts? Many of us, we are where we are because we think ourselves there. So maybe perhaps we uh, catastrophize in our mind where, where uh, for, uh, for we make a mountain out of a molehill or we uh, enlarge everything. For some of us, we have hypothetical worry. So even things that have never had the potential to face us or the things that we've never seen before, we worry or we are afraid about them. For, for some of us, we do uh, emotional reasoning. Uh, you know, I feel scared, so I must then be in danger. Or I feel guilty, so I must have done something wrong. Um, and so th there are a lot of unhelpful thinking patterns that are related to um, our cognition that get us to the places that we, are, that, that we are that normally we don't normally like, right? And so here's, this, uh, here's the next one. Um, oh. I was supposed to put up this train. See, um, I was supposed to, when I talked about cognitions, I was supposed to put up this train and talk to you about your train of thought. Like, okay, so it's kind of corny, but I'm going to tell you all anyway. So, um, uh, you know, think of yourself as going on a trip to a particular destination. Um, and they call it your train of thought because this train is taking you to where you want to go. Well, if I'm always thinking negative, then where's my train taking me? it's taking me in a negative direction. And so we teach people in the clinical space to sort of alter your negative thinking pattern so that you can reverse the flow, the direction of the train so that your thinking will get you to the direction or to the destination uh, that you're wanting to, to go in. So that's why I have that train in there. I, it's just a nice train and so I figured I should, I should talk about it. Um, I can't, yeah, okay. Let me hurry up before I start talking to myself. All right, the last one is uh, that of our choices. Some of us, <laughs> Some of us have, have, uh, have ourselves in difficult situations because, you know, we, we have, we've, we've chosen it. We've, we've made choices. We've, we've ignored warning signs and we've decided to not change our diet and we've decided to um, not seek help. And so the little small problems that we've had have now ballooned into greater problems. And, and, and they're, 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 it's related to the things that we've chosen. So I wanted to share you with these things with you all because I wanted you all to recognize that there are some of these things that we can control. There are some of the things, uh, if, if we're prone to worry or if we're prone to having what if thoughts, if we're prone to this thing called rumination where we go over and over in our mind the things that we would have done, should have done, could have done, uh, where we can't put ourselves to sleep because we're so busy with our minds working um, contemplating how things could have been different if we had just acted differently. So this idea of rumination. So um, a, a few of these things can be handled if we recognize or redirect our attention to the things that we actually uh, can control. Uh, research shows that when we sort of shift our focus uh, to what we can control, we can see meaningful or lasting differences in our well-being, in our health, and also in our performances. So it, what I encourage my clients to do uh, whenever they're faced with circumstances that they are uh, uh, or dis despondent about or they're upset about, I encourage them to make a list. Make a list of the things that you can control that you're worrying about and make a list of the things that you can't control uh, that you're worrying about. And most of the time, the things that people know, realize that they can't worry about, you can't worry about other people's decisions. You can't worry about other people's health. You can't worry about 
um, uh, uh, the, the, your government's actions. Hopefully yours acts better than mine. You can't worry about, uh, you can't worry about uh, uh, if I go to family dinner, there's going to be a fight that occurs that has nothing to do with me. We can't worry about getting old. We can't control getting older. We can't control the weather. And so the idea is paying attention to those things that are inside your control. And one of the things, or one of the quotes that I love, and I'm gonna have to go a little further, is these two quotes by Henry Nouwen. This is the first one. It's not the amount of darkness in the world that matters, but how we stand in the midst of that darkness that counts. Henry Nouwen, he wrote a great book, um, uh, 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 The Wounded Healer. Uh, and in the book, he talks about the idea that uh, if you wanna help people, um, and uh, you know, this is for the pastors that are on the line, if you wanna help people, he uses this analogy that if you live next to a cemetery, you can't cry at every funeral that eventually there comes a point where you have to change how you view the world in order for you to be able to stand and help people or be useful to people. And then this is the, this is the next one. And this is by another favorite author of mine. This is by uh, Viktor Frankl, and it comes out of his book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he says this, everything can be taken away from a person, but one thing, the last human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances or to choose one's own own way. I think these are very important um, as we talk about um, specifically uh, COVID-19 and the fear and the apprehension that many of us have, um, because we have to focus on those things that are in our control, those things that, um, that, that, that we can manage ourselves, and then make sure that those things that we worry about that are outside of our control we give those things over to God. We give those things over to those people who's, um, I don't want to get to um, to cycle babble on you, but Adlerian has this idea of, of tasks and he operates out of this, uh, Alfred Adler operates out of this understanding that every problem in life uh, revol 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 comes down to a problem with our interpersonal relationship where we attempt to complete a task that wasn't our task to complete. Well, it's making sure that we put onto people the task that belongs to them. As a, ch as a parent, my task is not to make decisions for my, for my child. That is her task. My task is to provide the space for her to explore and grow and for me to provide advice. My task as a husband is not to tell my wife what to do. I think that her task is to probably to tell me what to do, and that's fine. My task is to listen. Um, but uh, 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 we have to make sure that we're fulfilling our own tasks or controlling the things that we can control so that we don't focus so much on things that will never change. We can't change the weather. We can't change, um, uh, we can't change space and time, but God can. So we leave those things as Christians to God and we work on those things that we actually can control. So I want to talk to us a little bit about how we go about reducing anxiety or trying to figure out how it is we actually can deal with some of our negative thinking and our negative um, uh, uh, reactions to the things that are going on around us, right? So I'm, I, let me just go back here. Um, most of us we have challenges in one of these areas. These, th this, this is the five A's of adult life, the five needs of adult life, right? And I just want to include these because it goes back to what I was talking about with tasks and how we go about gaining our fulfillment in the accomplishment of our task. And so here are the four A's. The first is attention. If we're to be honest, most of us, we want to at least feel like people value us, like people see us, like people recognize us. So for most of us, there is a need for all of us for or toward attention, to get it and also to give it, right? The next is that of, of acceptance. Most of us, even if, even if we don't like ourselves, we want to still have people accept us as we are, right? Um, so many of us, we, we desire or we long for acceptance, this idea that we can belong, that people care about us, right? And then the next one is that of appreciation. Really, m many of us, we desire to, for people to tell us, you know what, 
I thank you, your, 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 your generosity to me, your presence in my life. I appreciate you. Um, appreciation also goes hand in hand with love and, 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 and gratitude for the person that, or the people that occupy the same space as you. And then the next is affection. Affection is just what it says. People want to be loved. They want to be told that, uh, or they want to be shown that someone cares about them. And then I think this last one is that of autonomy. People want to be themselves. People want, or, or people generally want to be able to make decisions and make choices for themselves. And when any of those things sort of get disrupted where we are right now, the natural inclination is to either get angry or to get worried or to get upset or to start lashing out, right? Okay. so. What I want to do is I sort of want to share with you all um, some tips that we can use for managing anxiety. But let me just ask, so let me just throw this out to Orlando and Liz. You all think, you think I should just go through these or should I take people's questions and then let them flow naturally out of the questions that they may ask? First, uh, Dr. Dave, can we take some questions first? And then yeah. maybe when you're going through that, I'll answer some of them. Yes, you're in charge. I owe you my seminary degree, so you can do it everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so are some of the things that you're going to be talking about also deal with depression or um, PTSD in any way? Does that, is that get included in anxiety? So um, with depression, depression is, depression is, um, it, now I want you to know that oftentimes depression and anxiety co-occur together. Depression and anxiety, those are the two most um, common mental health conditions that people are dealing with. And so, um, no, I wasn't going to necessarily deal with depression and PTSD today, but some of the tools that I'll share um, are useful also in helping people manage their depressive symptoms, as well as those, um, those, those reactions to whatever trauma or stressors they've been going through. Okay, uh, one more question, and then mm -hmm. maybe you can go into those, those tips. Okay, sure. Um, how do you overcome bitterness and anger due Ooh. to like trauma, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse? Do we have enough time to dive into that one? Um, okay, how do you overcome bitterness and anger due to trauma? All right. Um, no, it wasn't in my plan. Okay, so the way trauma works is trauma, trauma is almost like a switch. And so when, when it's unuseful, it oftentimes switches on. When we're triggered, it switches on. Mm -hmm. And so for many people that have dealt with trauma or that have experienced um, sexual trauma, physical trauma, um, abuse, emo uh, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, mental abuse, all types of abuse, um, for those individuals, oftentimes, um, when they try to enter into meaningful relationships or if they try to deal with something like COVID-19 or fear, what normally happens is they are triggered in some way. Um, and the only way sort of to deal with uh, trauma is to process it, is to talk about it, mm -hmm. is to talk about and, and, and live through sort of the reactions to it. And then there are some practical things that you can do if you've experienced trauma. The first thing I would recommend to you is, and I know that uh, if there are a lot of Adventists on the line, I know we don't really like to hear, go to counseling or go seek somebody professionally. But if you've dealt with trauma, I don't suggest that you try to deal with it on your own. Mm -hmm. I suggest that you try to sit down and speak with someone who is um, clinically prepared to deal and help you process and walk through that trauma. Um, because the truth of the matter is, even if we think we've dealt with it, even if we think that we are over it, that it doesn't impact us, that we've buried it, anything that we bury, you know, it eventually starts to come up to the front and you uh, it comes to the forefront. So if you bury it, it eventually starts to stink. Um, and so I would recommend that you go and you sit down, you talk to someone, you engage with someone, not only about the, the, uh, the details of the event or the problem that you're having, but also help the, they'll help you walk through doing things like uh, writing about it or, 
or um, or, or processing it in such a way that uh, that that you not relive it, but that you understand the impact of it. Because the truth of the matter is, many of us who go through trauma, we think that we we're, we're finished or that it's gone, but we carry the pain with us. And if we carry the pain with us, we still carry the behavior with us. And so for some of us that have dealt with, and we see it all the time, for some of us who've dealt with sexual trauma, um, we don't have healthy sexuality because we're still stuck in those traumatic experiences. For Mm -hmm. some of us that have experienced emotional abuse or physical abuse, um, you know, we ourselves become abusive. We ourselves um, become apathetic. Um, And so it's important to sit down and really talk about these things because no matter whether we think we've dealt with them or buried them, they are still there and it comes out in our behavior. And I bet you if you sat down and you talked to your significant other, or -hmm. if you sat and talked down or you sat with some of your friends, they'll let you know, yeah, there's some things that when this comes up, this is a little bit off that you do. When we talk about this particular issue, you usually make sort of uh, this thing that is small into something so big. And, and, and we call that sort of in the clinical space transference, where um, I'm now transferring old pain from something someone did to me a long time ago. I'm now transferring that in the present on someone else. Hmm. All right. Absolutely. And that's the short version. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank yes. you. I know Man, that was that's a loaded question. That one at you. Mm-hmm. Um, can you go through those those tips? The anxiety sure. ones? Sure, just, sure, sure. Just, just before you get into those yeah. tips, Doc, uh-huh. um, some people are just asking for resources. Have you read the book, um, The Body Keeps Score? Yes. Yes. So Ex- good. Exceptional book. So, so we're yes. just so letting good. people know that there are books there. That's one of them mm-hmm. that um, they kind of, you know, your body keeps score, especially in that trauma uh, stage yep. and um, kind of to understand it a little bit more. So. Mm-hmm. There's another one. Uh, it's an old one by, um, oh God, I can't remember his name. It says, if you can feel it, you can heal it. Okay. Um, there's another one, understanding, understanding sexual trauma. I can't, and I'm not in my off, I'm not in my, uh, I'm not in my counseling office. So I have, I only have religious books down here in my basement. So <laughs> I'm not in my office. So I can't, but I have them on the shelf somewhere. So what I can do is I can write you all an email and then maybe you all can awesome. post it somewhere for awesome. resources for dealing with trauma. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm-hmm. No problem. All right. So what was I supposed to do? Because I got distracted. Um, sorry. You're supposed to tell us how tips for how to manage anxiety. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, how, do we, how do we manage the anxiety that we have? Um, the truth of the matter is um, what we have, the, the, the best way to sort of deal with um, coping with anxiety is to do stuff like developing a routine. Now, Um, This also works for depression because for many people who are depressed, they try to operate off their feelings, but they never feel like doing anything. Mm -hmm. So, or they feel like doing the wrong things. And so they end up in this stuck repetitive cycle. So uh, developing a routine, you know, Um, another way is adopting a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, during this time, specifically during COVID time, Uh, This is a great time for people to pick up projects, maybe, that you've put down due to a lack of time. If we're to be honest, one thing that we've gotten as a benefit from this is it has provided us the space and the time to do some things that we haven't been able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, You know... I I mean, I know that we feel like we're working a little harder and, and time, you know, but I don't like, so my office, I live three hours from the conference office, Mm. right? (laughs) So on my conference days, I save six hours a day. (laughs) Now that gives me time for me to do something um, useful with myself. And so take time to take time to sort of uh, do something that you've put off for a long while. But also I want you to, I want us all to understand that during this COVID-19 time, this quarantining time, the point of it is not to be productive. The point is to stay safe and be alive. That's mm-hmm. the whole point. So mm-hmm. if you can add something to it, but I also don't want people who feel the pressure of needing to create something big or solve the world's problems while they're at home because they have time. I want to release you from that pressure. You are being successful during this time. If you're keeping yourself safe, if you're keeping your family safe, um, if you're doing the things that you know you need to do in order to protect yourself. And so don't feel like this great pressure to achieve this great task or to earn a Nobel Peace Prize or, or something like that yeah. during this it's time. True. Yeah. 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 Um, you said you feel a lot of pressure. 
Well, yeah, like when you see things on social media, um, which is not a great place to be anyway, but everyone's like, if you don't, you know, solve your issues during quarantine, then you had no excuse. And those messages are out there. Yeah. yeah. But your issue is that there's COVID-19 outside and you're trying to keep it from inside. And so as long as you're as long as you're being successful by 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 staying, by staying, by staying alive. alive and being staying safe. alive. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. the point. That's the point of this. There, there's 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 really no other point. Sure. We all should we all should be useful. We should all should make useful useful uh, use of our time. That that's that's good. That's good stewardship. God expects us not only to be good stewards of our money, but also of the time that he's given us. But yeah, don't put extra pressure on yourself to accomplish yeah. some big, great task, man. Just stay, just stay, stay safe. Yeah, Liz, well, relax. But, Thank you. But Dr. Nicole, 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 if you're a task-oriented type of person, how does that work? How if, if you're a task-oriented type of person, <laughs> how does staying safe work? Staying safe is your task. Yeah, but but I mean you don't you don't take it on as your task. You 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 propagate it as something else. You dis you you dis so you're dismissive of your you're dismissive of the things that you actually are accomplishing. So one of the things that one of the things that task oriented people do is they don't normally celebrate the accomplishment of completing a task because that's how they keep themselves motivated. They find the next task to uh, to sort of fulfill that need for 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 doing something. So a part of it is making sure you stop and, and appreciate uh, the, the things that you are doing, you know. Um, I, I am staying safe. My task is to keep my family healthy. Um, and then if you are sort of more so task oriented, by all means, if you set a schedule, um, if you uh, set a, a list of to do's even, um, that may help as well. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. If you have, if you no have questions, can you just put them on the chat? And then we'll we'll try and get to all of them. Okay, go ahead, Doc. Okay, all right. Um, so one of the ways in which we can sort of uh, reduce our anxiety with challenging our thoughts, because for many of us, our anxiety resides in our fear responses. Um, one of the things that we can do is we can use what's called the think technique. Um, and the think technique just simply looks like this. It's, it's the acrostic is think. The first is, is what I'm thinking true? Is this thought 100% true? If not, what are the fact? What are facts about what I'm thinking, and what is mm -hmm. opinion? So, if I think, oh, I'm good at nothing, asking someone, all right, well, let's let's find out whether or not this is true. You mean to tell me that there's nothing that you're good at? And most of the time, people find one or two things that they're good at, and you can say, well, you're not honestly being truthful with yourself by saying you're not good at anything if there are things that exist that you're good at, right? Okay. The next is, is it helpful? So is it true? The next one, is it helpful? Is paying attention to the thought that I'm having right now useful to me or is it useful to other people, right? Then the next one is, is it inspiring? Um, so is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Um, does the thought inspire me or does it have the opposite effect? So does me thinking that all um, um, uh, I can't, I got so much work, I can't do anything. Does that thought then lead you to trying something? Or does that thought then lead you to doing what it leads me to do? Just go sit in bed and watch TV. I'm not going to get it done anyway. So why do I even try? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so it's inspiring. <laughs> is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? The next one, is it necessary? Is it important for me to focus on this thought? Is it necessary to actually act upon it? And so if I think to myself, oh, I have all this stuff to do, am I, I need to ask myself if I'm worrying about, you know, um, reorganizing the closet or if I'm thinking about reorganizing my pantry. I have, I moved, we moved into this house like four years ago and I still have the books that are in my eye shot over here that are still unpacked after four years. And I, I'm telling myself I'm going to unpack them and move them from over there to the bookcases, which are over here. And I'm thinking to myself, huh, I'm not going to do that because I can get the books out of the box. Why do I need them on the bookcase? Is it necessary? That's a very poor example. I don't even know why I shared that. I was just feeling guilty seeing it. And then <laughs> if my wife is watching, I want to her, I want to acknowledge for her that I see it and I also hear you. All right. So is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? The last thing is, is it kind? Yes. 
The problem with our negative thoughts is oftentimes we are not kind to ourselves, okay? Um, my best friend says all the time, um, negativity does not need your help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and a lot of times, many of us, we focus so much on the negative side of things. If we could think positive, right? If we can open up ourselves to, um, to, to thinking um, with more gratitude, which leads me to the very last thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, and that is this idea of gratitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that I am grateful for? What are the things that, uh, uh, you know, uh, what are the things that I can say to myself, you know, every day, I'm grateful for this. Um, research has shown that gratitude uh, has a plethora of benefits, including reducing stress, reducing anxiety, boosting your mood, strengthening your immune system, improving your sleep, and most importantly, improving your relationships. Just thinking the things that, thinking about the things that you are grateful um, for. And uh, one of the ways to cultivate this gratitude is to keep a gratitude log. You know, each day set up in your, in your daily routine um, to write down just one thing that you're grateful for, maybe on a sheet of paper, in a journal, um, somewhere. And then I know that I said that was the last thing. This is the last thing now that I'm going to share. Um, do some writing. There's nothing wrong with taking out a pen and a piece of paper and writing down your thoughts, keeping a diary. Like if I had thought about it, I would have kept like a COVID-19 diary or something like that, mm -hmm. where I wrote down all of the uh, thoughts that I had or something. I would have made it to only two days, but it would have been nice to at least try it. Um, but, uh, you know, take time to sort of write things down, keep a journal. If you don't want to call it a journal, keep, call it a self-reflection book. If you don't want to call it that, take some self notes, take some, do something, spend some time writing and unpacking how not only you feel, but how you are thinking and putting it down on paper so that you can also, as you go through progressing, you can go back and you can have some evidence that, that sort of underpins the progress, uh, that you've been making. Hmm. That's awesome. Those are great tips. I love those. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard so much about the science behind gratitude and how it physically changes our brain as well. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot of those who are online who are also sharing some tips. Um, uh, just listening to running water and birds and just being able to relax. Um, others said that they have been able to cut their cable altogether and Ooh. <laughs> and, 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 and go on uh, nature channel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but one thing I did forget, right. Um, Orlando mm -hmm. and Liz, if you all can just allow me is if we can find ways every day to engage our five senses, mm -hmm. right. Find something that relaxes us that um, there's this idea of mindfulness where we become aware of everything that is around us. And so mm -hmm. how can I, um, focus on just one thing that heightens my senses. So perhaps, perhaps it is a sense of uh, your, you know, touch, taste, sight, smell, and hearing. So when I'm listening to music, how do I, um, when I say enter the music, I mean, how do I isolate the sounds that exist in the music? If mm. the sounds have a brass section, how do I pick out and just focus on just say the a trumpet or something like that? How do I pay attention to vocals? If I'm listening to something that has a harmony in it, how mm -hmm. do I pick out, say, just the alto voice and just focus on that? If I want to engage my sense of sight, well, when I'm sitting in my bed or I'm laying down or I'm waking up in the morning, how do I take one thing that's in my room and how do I just focus on that and trace the outline of it um, and see if I can see it again? It, you know, um, uh, how do I, you know, engaging in my sense of, of smell, you know, maybe it's a candle. Uh, maybe it's a, um, maybe it's a, it's breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we eat breakfast, but how many of us we just uh, put it on and don't take time to stand over the stove or the oven and just take in the mm -hmm. smell of it? it it's, mm -hmm. it's engaging with that. Stepping in the shower um, mm -hmm. and actually feeling the water on your skin, tracing mm -hmm. the raindrops as it falls down your body, hits your skin, and 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 and. And, and, and engaging with it as it as it rolls down your body to sort of center yourself and slow yourself um, so that, uh, you know, you can deal with those negative thoughts. And then, of course, you know, 
our, our biggest coping mechanism is that of prayer and the word of God, you know, so engaging every day in a daily routine of, 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 of prayer, of, of reading the word of God, but then also going back to God's original book, which is nature, going outside and taking in nature, taking in the sights and the sounds also of nature. Yeah, that was all I wanted to, yeah. That's awesome. Um, those are very, very awesome. helpful tips. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you help me for our attendees who are single? Mm -hmm. And they're at home and they don't necessarily might not have anyone to quarantine in their in their same home. Um, how does anxiety affect them differently or does it at all? Um, for, for many singles um, that um, are happily single and that wanted to be by themselves and enjoy being by themselves, they either are divorced and um, are not looking or they are they have decided that they're going to stay single. It's probably not if they're probably experiencing the same anxieties that many of us are experiencing. But for those people um, who are single and are looking for people or single and wanting to date, man, dating has is completely difficult now. Um, uh, uh, dating is harder. It's more difficult to get out and be with your friends. And so if you're living at home and you're alone, um, you know, isolation and loneliness can sort of make you sit with some of these negative think ne these negative thoughts. And so I would recommend to you that, you know, you find a circle of friends that you, um, that uh, you, 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 you still try to engage with um, the socialization that uh, you were engaging in before. Uh, finding spaces like this where you can get uh, with people like-minded people of, 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 of your, in your age group, of your cohort, and having conversations together, uh, finding people, uh, having Zoom meetings, and I know they're not exciting, um, eating your eating lunches and dinners through Zoom and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Whatever it is that you can do to sort of uh, reduce some of the isolation that you may feel. Um, but, uh, you know, and then I do help. So I was having a conversation with one of the singles in my conference because for some reason, Liz and Orlando, they make family life directors be singles ministries directors, mm -hmm. but then they mm -hmm. also want us to be married. That's kind of weird. But anyway, so um, I was having a conversation with some of the singles in my conference uh, doing my job. Um, I, I, and I said to them and they were like, well, you know, Doc, we want to, we want to be with someone. And, you know, you all are, you know, we have people that are sheltering in place with other people. We're by ourselves. And I was like, do you know what's worse than sheltering in place by yourself? Sheltering in place with someone you don't like, or you can't stand, uh -huh. or you don't get along with, or sheltering in place yeah. with the wrong person that you shouldn't be with, or you shouldn't have gotten married to. And so thinking that, uh, you know, making room in your mind that, this is not the absolute worst thing that could possibly happen to me. Making room in your mind for uh, 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 contingencies that, you know, it could it could technically be worse. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. What about the, the whole thing about how, you know, we need touch as humans, we need hugs. How does that work for people who, even for essential workers who aren't able to go to their home and hug their kids and their spouse, like, how does that work for our single friends? What can yeah. they do? <laughs> Is that a hard question, Dave? <laughs> no, but you know the answer already. <laughs> well, there is nothing. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, someone said virtual hugs, virtual high fives. There we go. Yeah. I mean, to tell the truth is, there's nothing just like we can't hug and touch people outside of our homes. Yeah. Like my sister came by to, to bring me food mm -hmm. and I wanted to hug her and she's single. She lives by herself. Well, I shouldn't tell people that because then someone will go find her. But anyway, she lives by herself. Um, and I wanted to hug her and mm -hmm. I, I did, I hugged her and she says, I haven't had a hug in eight days. I mean, in eight Aww. weeks. And I wanted to, you know, she's my big sister and bullied me as a child. So I don't really right. care. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to say, well, that's good for you. But no, I, it was good to hug her. Um, and I felt something about that. Um, someone's put in the chat, Don's put in the chat, uh, practice self-hugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, <laughs> this, time, this, time, this time is terrible. But yes. We, yes. Can, we can get through it if, if, we, if we do the things that we need to. This, hug a tree. Hug a, hug a pet. That's not human touch. Yes, yes. 
Um, there's a question that came through. How do you develop resiliency despite multiple stressors or tra uh, tragedies? Mm -hmm. the, the foundation of developing resiliency is understanding is understanding the past, right? Mm -hmm. And so we recognize in the past, um, I've been dealt with certain, I've been dealt a hand. I've dealt with these things in the past or I've dealt with something in the past. Well, how do I use, we, even if we look at it like a credit report, when you go to the bank to see if they'll give you a loan, they check your credit report. They want to know whether or not um, they can trust you to pay your bills. We have the history of paying your bills. Well, resiliency is the sort of the same way. Well, when I was under difficult circumstances before, this is how I got through it. This is how I worked through it. This is how God brought me through it. This is how I used my spiritual coping mechanisms. This is how I used physical, behavioral, um, existential coping mechanisms. This is how I sort of worked through this. Mm -hmm. And so resiliency is built first by looking at how we've dealt with um, um, bad situations in the past. And then resiliency is built with trying to figure out how it is we can underpin ourselves for the future. So what are the resources? What are the things that I'm good at? What are the things that are useful to me? What are the things that, uh, um, what are the things that I um, believe are good about myself? And then paying attention and focusing on those things, paying attention to not the things that you don't have, but the things that you do have and heightening or growing those things that you do have. It's almost like push. It's almost like looking at it as a growing edge. You know, yeah. all of us, we have a, a, an edge to us. Well, how do we push the edge a little bit? How do we grow? Um, how do we develop the routine that we know uh, we need to go through in order to do the things that we need to do? How do we develop the, the healthy diet? How do we develop, um, how do we develop, uh, the connection with other people? How do we ask for help? This is the big thing. How is it that we ask for help? Why do we not ask for help? Um, sitting with ourselves and trying to figure out why is it that I won't call a therapist? Why is it that I won't call a psychologist? Hmm. And there's some people that, um, that, that come to us for prayer and they don't need prayer. They need a psychiatrist and medication. Um, well, how do, we, how do we pursue that? I mean, of course, you need prayer and that. Not just no prayer, but prayer. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, how do we uh, how do we sort of deal with that? Um, yeah, but that's how we develop resiliency. We look at how things happened in the past. We look at the things that we do have right now, um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so we, okay. we we have a few hands that are up. Uh, we're just gonna take uh, one or two, and then we'll close it off for tonight. And so uh, V Smith at MetaCenter.ca, we're going to unmute you. And uh, if you can go ahead and uh, ask your question. Oh, I apologize. I didn't know my hand was up. Please forgive me. Okay. No, no. Is, is that Victor? You're forgiven, hey, sir. Bad. That's no problem. Hey, <laughs> drop here, buddy. <laughs> um, uh, he has Pastor a good voice, Stanley. though. Pastor Stanley, your hand is up. I think that might have been up. From before? Okay. Yeah. That's fine. So, um, hey, we just want to thank you. Thank you so much for um, for this evening. And I know that uh, I can speak on behalf of everyone who is uh, here with us this evening that we just wanna thank you. Um, just a quick question. What, how can people connect with you or listen to you more? I know that you do have um, things on Facebook and uh, I don't know if you have a YouTube channel, but uh, you're there constantly so people can tune in um, and uh, listen of some more wisdom from Dr. David Defoe. Well, most of the time, um, most of the things that we do is on our Relationship Ministries webpage. Our conference calls Family Ministries, Relationship Ministries. I don't know why, but anyway, preceded me. But um, yeah, so we do have a Relationship Ministries page. Um, what the address is, I don't, I mean, I know the website, but um, the Facebook page, if you just search AEC Relationship Ministries, it'll be there. If uh, there's an a, there's a relationship ministries uh, YouTube page as well. But if you go to our website, our conference website, which is the Allegheny East website, which is visit aec.org slash relationship men, uh, relationship M I N. Um, most of the webinars and stuff that we do have been archived there. And then also the ones that we have coming up um, are also listed on there as well. Like we do something every Saturday afternoon at four o'clock. Um, and yeah, we're starting a show on, uh, the 24th called Sunday Conversations on Love, Sex, Dating, Relationships. And uh, um, I'm going uh, to call Orlando and Liz, and you all are going to pay back this favor and come on that Sunday <laughs> conversation. You got yeah. it, man. You got yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah.
<laughs> uh, quick question, Doc. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you are a, a therapist. Yeah. Do you see people, I mean, you see everybody virtually now, but do you also take clients from Canada? No, I can't. I'm not oh, licensed right. to practice in Canada. Licensed. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I only, I'm only licensed to practice in one state in our conference territory too. So people mm -hmm. get angry too, but I only licensed to counsel in Maryland. And so all the folk that live in Virginia and DC and Delaware and Pennsylvania and, and New Jersey and West Virginia, they get upset, but yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you once again for being here, everyone. We just want to remind you, uh, we will be sending out, you'll look for the resources on the Ontario Connect SDA Facebook page, and we will have the list of um, kind of those suggested books that we talked about and other things that you might find helpful. So check in a couple of days. We'll wait on getting some of that information from uh, Dr. Defoe. And if you want to sign up for the Spice It Up, mm -hmm. Um, married couples conference or so if you're engaged it's also a great time to get information from dr beverly and david sedlachuk yep yep um so we are going to pray uh before we pray um we will put this broadcast on our youtube page yep. which is uh, oc uh, sda connect ministries on youtube so if you go there you'll be able to get this and uh re-watch it and also share with it uh with those that are uh within your network as well um anything else before no, just we thank pray you for all your comments yeah. everyone thank you all for being here and uh thank you so much dr defoe thank you so much for your time and uh just sharing with each of us here this evening all right thank you for having me uh pastor dave can you pray for us please sure sure thank you. father in heaven we thank you so much for your love we thank you for your mercy to us god i want to Pray first for Liz and Orlando, God, and I want to ask you to continue to be with them as they continue to serve um, the, the men, the couples, the singles, the families uh, in the Ontario Conference. God, continue to inspire them with creativity and wisdom. And then, Lord, for everyone that has come on the broadcast this evening, uh, that may be on the Zoom call or watching it elsewhere, Father, we pray that you continue to be with them, that you continue to um, underpin us with the idea and the notion that you are in control, that even when we don't understand what it is that you're doing, even when we are troubled on every side, even though when we're afraid, when we have anxiety, that you, God, are still in control. Help us to have the faith to trust and believe in you, that you're on your throne. And as long as you're on your throne, you will work everything out for Amen. our good. Father, we pray for those that may be suffering with um, anxiety, with uh, depression, with PTSD, with other mental health concerns, God. Give them not only the courage uh, to seek professional help, Lord, but give them the assurances that there is recovery, not only in their work, but in your work. Amen. We love you and we thank you, God, and we long to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.